Marco Streng has made millions in cryptocurrency. He started mining Bitcoin in his dorm room. Nearly a decade later, the 28-year-old college dropout turned a single wheezing computer into a lucrative crypto mining empire. What you're seeing here is the Enigma facility, which is the largest Ethereum uh, mining facility in the world. And uh, it was an exciting time. It was years ago when we came here and, uh, and built this. And uh, now we're expanding and expanding further and further because the demand is growing and everyone is, is ramping up the capacity. If you have the money, you can always buy cryptocurrency. Last year, Bitcoin peaked at almost $20,000. Or you can earn it by running a cryptocurrency mine a network of computers that serve as the backbone of the crypto economy. What are these machines doing? So th those computers are miners. They are mining cryptocurrencies and they are validating the transactions on the blockchain. And they get a reward for that. So if I pay somebody for something yeah. in a cryptocurrency, it's being validated potentially by one of these computers. Yeah, that's true. And when somebody makes that transaction, you validate it here in Iceland and you make money. Yes. How I, much does one of these cost to create? If I'm going to create one of these at home, one of these units? $2,000. And how many are in here, in this one warehouse here? Tens of yeah. thousands. Yeah. Tens of thousands. Mining operations like Marco's were made possible by pseudonymous programmer Satoshi Nakamoto, who in 2009 created Bitcoin a decentralized digital currency run by no one entity and beyond the control of any one government. But Nakamoto, whose true identity remains a well-guarded secret, faced an obvious problem. If no physical currency exists, who tracks the ownership of a digital coin? To solve this, he created the blockchain, software that records and stores information, like who owns a Bitcoin, on a decentralized ledger shared across millions of computers. It can't be changed and it's nearly impossible to hack. The big thing about mining in general is that it's not one single central entity that validates all the transactions. The miners all over the world are validating them. So this server farm on this kind of moonscape of Iceland, this might replace a central bank. It's not only replacing, actually. It's uh, making a, a central entity uh, obsolete. It's a scam, it's a bubble, it's going to burst, everyone's going to lose all their money. So for some cryptocurrencies, it's most likely true, but I see real value in, for example, Bitcoin or Ethereum. The underlying technology is phenomenal. I've had people tell me this, that this is the most revolutionary technology that we've seen since the wide-scale adoption of the internet very comparable to the beginning of the internet. At the beginning, it was just a protocol, very abstract. But now, I mean, we're nearly doing everything in the internet. Blockchain, which some are comparing to the early days of the internet. It sounds confusing, but listen up. It introduces so many opportunities, so many unique business models. People say blockchain could end companies as we know them. For regulators, uh, it is certainly a concern. You have things like the SEC, you have FinCEN, you have the IRS. But while the business world scrambles to exploit it and governments rush to regulate it, countries like Russia see a very different opportunity. My sense of cryptocurrency is uh, largely driven to evade U.S. sanctions and to undermine uh, sovereign currencies. Both of them are a challenge to the national interest of the United States. We need to search for unconventional solutions. These are the people who will build our new future and live there. One of those unconventional solutions is the Ethereum blockchain, created by a man named Vitalik Buterin. Я с большим удовольствием приглашаю на сцену основателя компании Ethereum, главный рок-н-ролльщик биткоина и майнинга Виталия Бутерина. Raised in Canada to Russian parents, Vitalik is the blockchain movement's biggest celebrity. If blockchains are in a vast transformative as you know, the proponents are saying they are, then that would imply that eventually we'll see hundreds of millions of people using it in some way or another. Vitalik created the Ethereum blockchain when he was just 21 years old, and its cryptocurrency, the Ether, is second only to Bitcoin. Its market cap increased by over 10,000% in 2017. Vitalik is on a global campaign to raise awareness of his creation. 
and its potential applications for business, finance, and government. Where are we going now? Um, we are going to Kazan, which I understand is the capital of the Republic of uh, Tatarstan in Russia. You know, like I've met government people from Canada, US, UK, Russia, China, Taiwan, Singapore, mm, Thailand. It's usually the central banks want, want to have a chat and like, why not? But you're 23 years old and you're saying sentences like, usually the central banks want to talk with me. That's not, it's very rare, I would probably oh. say. Mm. I'm older than you and nobody okay. wants to talk to me. Um, Hi. Am I riding with you guys? Did we, is that, uh, no, yeah, we can't. No, I think you're, you're riding to this car. So we're behind a very nice Mercedes that we're not allowed to be in because it's a VIP car. Vitalik, who's treated like something of a rock star here. The Kremlin rolled out the red carpet for Vitalik, hoping their prodigal son would return home. Right now we are going to the unified presentation center of the Republic of Tatarstan. Oh, sure. This is the place where we make wow effect. So the government of Kazan is pulling out all the stops for Vitalik. We are on what appears to be hour three of a uh, never-ending tour of the city. And uh, what this has to do with blockchain is anyone's guess. The Russian government's hope is that Vitalik's technology can be as transformative for their own finances as it has been for his. So I heard about Bitcoin for the first time in maybe February 2011. Eventually, I uh, yeah, found a guy who was willing to pay me five Bitcoins per article for writing articles for his Bitcoin blog. And what was Bitcoin worth at the time? Each Bitcoin was $0.8. $0.8, so you're doing five per article, and now that would be $5,000 an article. Right. More or less. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, being a, a high school guy with not much money, I thought $1.5 an hour was a fairly reasonable wage. So I, uh, yeah. <laughs> That was a good deal to you. Yeah, <laughs> $1.5 totally. an hour. Yeah, fight for 1.5. <laughs> yeah. Explain to me why this technology is so transformational that people think it'll change the world. Because they represent kind of epochal changes in the, the options that we have for interacting with each other. With uh, Bitcoin, it's, uh, you don't need banks to send money anymore. It's just something that happens directly peer to peer. And Ethereum extends that to m making digitally enforceable agreements. But that changes whole industries, doesn't it? And it hasn't yet, but we'll see. What is it about Vitalik? Why are you so interested in, in blockchain? Because Tatarstan is considered to be the innovative uh, republic. You want to be the sort of Silicon Valley of Russia. Exactly. That's what we are trying to do. And, Vita and, and Vitalik seems like a guy that could help you do that, right? He is considered to be like an IT hero, let's say, for young people. Is that something that the Kremlin in Moscow is, is happy Ye about? Yes. It is? I think so, yeah. The Kremlin arranged for Vitalik to meet one of Putin's powerful surrogates. Tatarstan President Rustam Minikhanov. Yeah, apparently. Американский пол и бильярд это две разные игры, да? Да, это русский бильярд сложнее. Больше шары, меньше лузы. И стол больше. Слабенькие американцы. In expectation of his arrival, the president arranged a hackathon for Vitalik in hopes that he might inspire a new generation of Russian tech leaders. 
So we're at a government-sponsored blockchain yes. hackathon yes. where Vitalik is the star guest and one of the judges. This is a high technology park that is intended to support IT industry and startups. Mm -hmm. The goal is to make an ecosystem that will produce people, that then will produce companies, that then will produce technologies. United States has approximately 2.5 million IT people working in the IT industry, very active, and Russia is just 400,000. And but a lot of your very smart Russians come to work in America too. A lot, a lot. The leak how we call it, the leak of the brains. But this is something that Russia can lead in. We if hope. If you get in early we with hope. blockchain. We hope. We that's hope. kind of the idea, isn't it? It is. In 2016, the Kremlin was on the verge of banning cryptocurrency transactions. But that hostility has turned to opportunity. Putin, alongside rogue regimes in Iran and Venezuela, realized that an anonymous, virtually untraceable currency could provide an opportunity to evade crippling international sanctions. When you were at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum, you were pulled aside by President Putin. Mm -hmm. What was that like? What did he want to talk about? Mm -hmm. I introduced uh, to him, you know, what Ethereum was and what I was doing, and it seemed like he was um, willing and uh, supportive of like uh, anything that we can do to kind of make the Russian economy better. As U.S. lawmakers are working out how to regulate cryptocurrencies, Russia is making major moves to integrate it, not only in an effort to avoid U.S. sanctions, but to undermine the power of the dollar in international trade. Sergei Gorkov was trained by the FSB as a Putin confidant and currently serves as head of Russia's largest state investment bank, which was hit with sanctions by the Obama administration in 2014. He recently signed a deal with Vitalik in support of a new blockchain research institute. Tell me why the bank is so particularly interested in blockchain. Banks, commercially, understand that traditional banking activity наверное, не будет существовать в том виде, в котором существует долг, который, конечно же, не будет предполагать, что банк как банк будет существовать, как будет существовать как сейчас. What would you tell a country who hasn't embraced blockchain technology? Представь, кто-то в 90 году или там в начале 2000-х или в 90-х сказал, мы не хотим внедрять интернет в своей стране, где бы эта страна находилась сейчас. Да, вот тот, кто не будет заниматься блокчейном, I think in 20-30 years, it will be in the end of the world.